Well, it's nice to meet everybody tonight. It's really nice to be here uh, with you. Um, I recognize as I walk around the room, I have something in common with almost everybody in the room. I um, have had the opportunity to be mentored many, many times in my career, especially early in my career. And I've had the opportunity to be a mentor uh, formerly uh, with the uh, Penn State Schreier Honor College. I serve as a mentor, I've been a certain mentor. And so I something from all of you. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking a little bit more about my experiences. Um, I remember when I was a college senior thinking about what I wanted to do. I remember wanting to hear from um, people that had made it, whatever made it meant at that time, whatever it had been a CEO or a leader in a company, that's something that I aspired to do when I was anxious to take in whatever I could learn from them. So it's from that frame that I prepared my remarks today to talk about finding your constants in a world of change, which for me is distilling what I think is most important about having a career, my career has been in technology, but I have to think technology is so pervasive that any career we're going to embark on today is going to be one that's going to be filled with constant change. And what has helped me the most in my career, as I reflect back, is no way to find constants. And so that's the, the title of the speech. And this is a small crew and a small group, and I think that's fantastic. And I'm really happy to take questions throughout the conversation. I have prepared remarks that I could uh, talk about for a couple hours. If you know me well, you know I can talk for a couple hours about almost anything related to business, zigzag that river in my career. But I really want to focus on what you want to hear about, particularly the, the students. Uh, any questions you have that I may be missing, I really want to be able to help you as much as I can in our, in our hour together uh, today. Uh, so finding your constants that won't change. When I did my speech class at my MBA at uh, Penn State in, 19, oh man, in, in the 1980s, uh, my speech professor said, Dave, you always have to have three points. No matter what talk you're giving, you have to have three points. Um, so my three point speech would be why identity, conviction, and learning are the keys to success. So I'll keep coming back to those three points identity, conviction, and learning are the keys to success in a career in technology. So we're going to talk about identity. I should talk a little bit about who I am. Um, very kind introduction, you know, gave you an outline of my business career. Before I was in business, obviously, the first thing I was, I was a son. I was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, I joke, my first to get books. Exactly like Barack Obama, it's a piece of paper, uh, but uh, that's me. Uh, so I not only was a son, I became a, a, a brother. Um, later I became a, a, a husband and then a father. I'm not showing here, I recently became a grandfather. So I have an almost three-year-old grandson and an almost one-year-old grandson. So family is really important to me. It's always been important to me, and that's a big part of who I am. I'm also a runner. I'm a Steelers fan. I'm a State fan. You know, these are things about my identity. This talk is really about sharing my work experiences, and so just a really quick background so you understand you know, kind of where I'm coming from. You know, I feel uh, it's really, really fortunate. I grew up in a college town. I actually grew up in State College, Pennsylvania, right there at Penn State. That put me into a learning environment. Um, from the time I started school, I was around professors' kids, and my friends' parents were professors. Learning was all around everything that I did when I. Uh, I got an opportunity to have an internship when I was just 16 years old, and that internship was working on the second PC in the high-tech company in town. It's 1981, I was 16 years old, and the PC came out, and there's a thing called Lotus Notes. The students were looking at what are you talking about? It was actually, it was actually a, a, a VisiCalc 123 before Lotus. VisiCalc 123 was my program I worked on and my job was to type in the, the key numbers from the finance reports into a spreadsheet so we get a nice looking report for the president of the company. So here I am, 16 years old, going through financial reports, preparing them on a PC 
the presence of the company. You can see how this early exposure to what was going on in technology back then was important in forming a career. I was a bellhop at the Nicky Lion and um, did lots of other odd jobs. But the, the, the team at What's Now Raytheon realized they couldn't live without me. They hired me full time um, right after college. I worked there with Kate for my MBA. That was a super fantastic experience for anybody who's thinking about getting an MBA. Um, uh, working and doing it at the same time, working before you do it, is a really high recommendation of mine because the learning experience is so much more full and rich when you have some work experience going back um, for that MBA. So that was a period of time I, I worked there for five years. Um, got my MBA. I had great mentors here. Again, this is a town where um, the, at the time there were 40,000 people and 40,000 students. So it was a town where I was working with the parents of my friends from high school. and So they were really invested in, in you know, Dave Wagner just wasn't, Dave Wagner was um, Jim and Emily's son, Dave Wagner's someone that was um, at the church there. Dave Wagner, so they, I really was invested in, uh, in the mentee kind of relationship. And that was super helpful, so I got to be involved. Um, it, it, I was young, but that was 10 years, from 16 to 26, working in this um, <laughs> division of now, uh, way beyond. So when I finished my MBA and went out into the real world, I moved from um, State College, Pennsylvania, down to Dallas, Texas, to get involved in this thing called the, the network. We didn't really need to call the internet right then. We're just going to change the world with the network. And, uh, and then I, I found myself in a, in a group of other MBAs. I had five years of work experience, and many of my peers had not had work experience or had more than two years of work experience. So then I get kind of all the best assignments in my leadership program because I had this great experience. Um, that ended in getting uh, the job um, as finance manager for the business unit that didn't fit. Everything in the networks that didn't fit got put into this business unit. And so we had 13 businesses. One of them was this little invention called Entros, which was doesn't matter the technology, the public the infrastructure. And I was able to join on that little business when it was um, $3 million in revenues, less than 50 people, a small business. We um, were able to grow that very rapidly. We spun that out of our town networks. It grew from 3 million to 151 million over a six year period. I had you know, luck or good fortune or whatever. I intercepted this business opportunity. I was the senior financial manager, the senior finance person at this organization. Um, four or five years before we went public, the time uh, we did our secondary, the largest secondary in history the NASDAQ. Um, I worked for a CFO, I was 31 when we were public, so I worked for a CFO for uh, nine years until they promoted me to be uh, CFO. I ran with the CFO there from 2003 to 2013. In 2013, um, we had gone private, we got sold on and integrated the bigger company, I became the president of Entrust, integrate Entrust into the larger. Uh, and trust data cards, so a hundred million dollar company merging into a five hundred million dollar company. I led that integration, and then just as luck would have it, when it came time for me to separate from that role, opportunity knocked, and a, a friend called up and said, "Hey, Dave, I'm retired from Six. I think you'd be the great successor to me as CEO. Can you find me a CEO?" And, that sounds cool. <laughs> and, uh, and that brought me then to Six and that uh, worked So that's a little more detailed introduction, primarily for the purpose of giving you context of what my career looked like. Uh, you know, hopefully hear a little bit more about how I perceived my learning journey, which was critical to that, how um, identity, conviction of learning are fundamental to that. There's a, a little bit of luck, a lot of hard work, and a lot of support from a lot of people um, to get um, to, the, to where we are today. Just some trends that I would want to share if I, you know, now that I'm 55, so you know, thinking back, and you know, what would the 21-year-old uh, Dave would want to know, and the three big trends that I would have you think about as you're planning out <clears throat> your careers are technology, um, lifespans, and bigger companies. 
And so just in terms of technology, this is what technology looked like. This was high tech in, in, uh, in the early 80s. Uh, we didn't have email, we had message boards. And so how could I have ever imagined that I would be the president and CEO of an email security company with email taking these things? Um, so technology is changing things very, very rapidly. It's changing the nature of where uh, employment is. And you can see this graph, you think of where the jobs are. Uh, somebody in the room is thinking about a career in healthcare. Those jobs are growing and growing and growing. They're going to continue to grow. Manufacturing is going down. Technology is getting relatively stable. So I think these are trends that you need to think about when you think about your career. The other really big trend, this one is mind-blowing to me. It's absolutely mind-blowing. It was presented to me at my uh, an inauguration event. And the speaker who was a uh, um, special at the Georgetown on, on education and what should higher education be. And he had um, this premise that technology is changing so rapidly, machines are becoming better and better and better at what doing what machines can do, obsoleting so many of our jobs. So what are the jobs going to be? They're going to be services jobs. We're going to be able to be more and more human. We're going to be doing the jobs that machines can't do. So think about things like um, nutritionists. Think about things physical therapists. Think about things that, um, and if you're in accounting, that's fine too, right? Because it, these, all these businesses will be accountants. But um, in terms of where it's going, um, we are going to a, a, a place where machines are going to automate so much of what we do today. Driverless cars are coming, or we would have believed that even five years ago, they are coming. That's going to disintermediate hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs across the country. What are we going to do? We're going to help each other be more human. Entertainers. We're going to entertain each other in ways that we did not, uh, we're not able to think about today because we're going to have a lot more time, a lot more money, a lot more freedom to be doing things that help make each other more human. We're going to live a lot longer. So the mind-blowing statistic is that if um, you were born after 1999 and you're female, <laughs> um, you're, you will probably live to be 100. College educated, college educated uh, females born after 1999, the first cohort in the history of mankind to have a life expectancy of 100. So what does that mean when you're here at 21 thinking about your future and thinking about your career and in this world of change? What's it going to mean to you to be able to have a life expectancy of 100? It, you know, it might mean you retire at 55. It might mean you're going to have a fulfilling life doing things you're not even imagining yet into your 70s um, because you're still going to have 20 years of retirement. To look forward to. So longer lives, smarter technology. This is just data to support my assertion. Um, this is from the, uh, the Norwegian uh, uh, government um, life expectancy service. The other thing I had to think about is where do you want to work? What kind of organization do you fit best in? you fit best in a small company where you get to see a lot of what's going on? Or do you feel like you're fit best in a really big company um, that has a lot, can have a lot of global impact? So we think about the concentration and the growth of companies, that the segment of um, uh, technology that I've been in most of my career is enterprise software. Enterprise software, the entire market is dominated. 42% of the revenue comes from these six companies. And if you look at these six companies, and we were going to make a bet on which of the six will be in a better position five years from now, I didn't think the two biggest, Amazon and Microsoft. You know, the other four are in a weaker position. This is of the top six companies that make up 42% of the market. The biggest are getting bigger. That's the network effect. That's what's happening as we can centralize these data centers. The bigger companies have such a big <coughs> advantage, and they're getting bigger and bigger. And so that's, you know, that's just the trend. And this is the data that supports that assertion. The, um, the, the uh, orange line 
are the number of jobs in companies with more than 2,500 employees. The blue line is the number of jobs at companies with less than 100 employees, but not charted are the jobs at companies between 100 and 2,500, where I've spent my whole career. Um, those companies are really getting squeezed. And that's because the really big companies are leaving opportunities for localization and customization for small businesses in your communities. So why we're not entrepreneur thinking about where, and or a person starting a career and thinking of where I want to work, I would be thinking about the middle market squeeze and then that's leaving us with a choice, not a unique choice, but a choice of do I want to work in a small company and have the benefit of being a small team or do I want to work at a really, really large company. This also affects uh, entrepreneurship and where uh, investment dollars are going, the venture capital funding is going up and up and up, and it's going up and up and up into the really, really big companies. Think um, Lyft, Uber, WeWork, there's money's flocking in uh, to these really big companies, again, driven by wanting to get the economies of scale and driving the very high valuations, while the angel seed investment into smaller companies is going. So these are some trends that I would have you think about as you're thinking about your careers. And so, welcome to the age of uncertainty. Some of you, some of us, uncertainty is really scary. Others of us, uncertainty is super exciting. I can't wait to understand what it's going to be like having the first drive of this car. Um, so I, I can't wait. I think I'll let someone else <laughs> someone else drive, drive the car. I'll drive the thank you. But, but anyway, this age of uncertainty is coming. And so um, what do we need to do about it? And that brings me to uh, the three constants. As I reflect on um, of my career, again, you know, never could have been dreamed of being CEO of email security company, but when there wasn't email. Um, reflecting back on how my career has developed and evolved, the three most important things uh, to me have been identity, conviction, and learning. And so I want to unpack that a little bit for you. I'm going to stop for a second. Um, I am really open in this class to kind of ask any questions. So in that first part that I've gone through before I dig into the next part, I uh, prepare to mark any questions for me. Okay. Yes. You talk about the bigger companies getting bigger. What is Zix after versus doing to prepare itself for the bigger get bigger trend? So what we're doing is a great question. What are we doing? And there'll be some more except for things later. But we're we're doing is focusing on the smaller businesses. And we're recognizing in the work that we do that um, that we want to be around to help those uh, small businesses with less than 100 employees take care of their IT. And that IT is going to be outsourced. And so we're looking at. I, I have this picture I draw from the Microsoft executives of a big bell curve. And I said, Microsoft, you should own everything in the middle. Um, but on the edges, the small businesses need that uh, localization, personalization services, and then there's a set of um, uh, functionality that doesn't get built in uh, because of the model of the software, and so we are integrated software vendor that helps with uh, specialized requirements. So we are intentionally looking at this trend and building to the, the edges of the health curve where Microsoft is, uh, hopefully. <laughs> Going to dominate everything uh, just yet. <laughs> yes, sir. You mentioned identity, and then um, you're talking about what type of company you would want to work for, a niche that you would want to work in. Um, for someone that doesn't have a lot of experience in either company, how would you suggest uh, moving forward in finding your identity and what type of environment you want to work for or with? That's fantastic, and that is a, a perfect tee up to the rest of my talk. And I will come back, if you don't mind, I'm going to give the rest of my talk, that's the perfect straight man. I'm going to give the rest of my talk, and I will make sure that I answer your question. If I already don't mind, I want to do it in the context of the rest of my talk. That's the perfect question, thank you. Um, so I introduced myself, 
I gave you lots of things about me, but is that really who I am? Am I really just the president of that river? <coughs> no. no. Um, identity is deeper than that. Identity is who am I and what do I believe? And so I'm a little bit on the uh, Taipei side. I'm a little bit on the deliberate side. I'm a little bit on the intentional side. But this is a letter that, um, it's actually version two of a letter that I wrote to myself. I wrote version one right when I graduated college. This is version two after I finished my MBA, and I'm going to read it for you. Um, my, my goal is to honor God in everything that I do. For my wife, I will be a loving and supportive partner for my children. I will be an involved and caring parent committed to raising them to live to their potential and to enjoy their lives to the fullest. In my career, I will always focus on the long term and put people first. I'm committed to making a difference in the organizations in which I work, to be a leader, positive example, both personally and professionally. So that's what the 26 year old Dave um, wrote to himself, V2, the letter that I had written at, at 21. I didn't do that without help. I was not able to get to that point to understand who I am and what I believe without help. And help comes in a lot of forms, and these great mentors, I don't know who all night about what they are, but these two, these two books were what informed those writings. The first card that I've since lost was tucked in the front of In Search of Excellence, which is an oldie but a goodie in terms of business reading. And the second one um, was, until recently, I pulled it back after this talk, was tucked in the cover uh, in search of um, uh, highly effective people by Stephen Covey. So learning and knowing your identity are really interconnected. You can't know who you are without being open to learning. Self-awareness is one of the hardest things to do is be aware, really aware of, of who you are. And you almost it's almost impossible to do that by yourself. You need mentors, you need to read, and you need to be open to self-aware and self-critique and input constructive from others. So let's take a look at the second part of, of, my, of my part. I told you in my introduction, so family has always been super important to me. Work has always been really important to me. And so what did I talk about in my 26-year-old self? Um, I talked about, I didn't talk about I wanted to be a CEO. I didn't talk about a salary I wanted to have. Those things are absent from this note. I will always focus on long term, put people first. I want to be a leader. I want to be a positive example. Not just what it means to be a great worker, but hopefully what it means to be a good friend as well. So that, that's a lot of sharing. Um, that is a little more detail. You wouldn't, you know, until we're in relationship with one another, you wouldn't commit. But that's a little bit more who I am. That's a little bit more about what I believe. So why was that so important in my career? I would not, in my opinion, be here if I had not started with the foundation of identity and conviction. And I want to tell you a story of why that became so important. So I've had the opportunity to work on right Nortel Networks. You were all too young to, to, to know this, remember, and all of you, some of you remember it. Um, from 1995 to 2001, we had this thing called the internet bubble, and everybody was getting rich. Money was flying everywhere, and this is the stock price of the company that I worked at. I was in the, I had an MBA, I was the leadership development program, I was talking to vice presidents and mentor things, and what it was going to look like. I knew financially what it meant if I was going to get to be a vice president of that firm. I got you know, elevated to the level of senior accounting man or senior finance manager, and I got a phone call. Dave, Dave, doesn't matter who it was, Dave, this is Ken. Um, Frank called, and Frank wants to make a journal entry. Frank wants you to move $2 million from your PL to the other PL. Frank was the CFO. It wasn't a crime, but it wasn't right, and I said, I'm not going to do it. 
I'm not going to do it. Can't, I'm not going to do it. That makes no sense. It's not right. I'm not going to do it. And we had a couple phone rolls around on, on doing that. Ken, name was in the newspaper. It wasn't that year, but those little, little violations led to the big violation that blew the thing up. What I learned from that was that that environment was not an environment I was going to be in. That is not a place that I was going to stay. And so when I had the opportunity to move on with this new company that was smaller and I understood the ethics and the values of the people that I was going to work with at the senior level, that was something I could identify with. I could not identify with what was going on here. I left there seven years before the fraud came out, but I was on the phone with one of the gentlemen, three accounting professors. I was on the phone with one of the gentlemen who had called her friend um, to make the entry. That guy got the SEC law. That's when identity conviction mattered. Make sense? Third point. So you, you have to know who you are, you have to be convicted in your beliefs, and you have to be open to learning. I love that 34 of artists did this, not me or a graphics person. So that's 34 years that I've been out of school. 34 years since I got my undergrad. And the stack of books so it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I remember thinking clearly after two years of going to networks, I'm like, holy smokes, they, you have learned more in two years than you learned in, in eight years. I am in four years because I did more time. But you've learned, you've learned more in two years than you learned eight years in, in business school. The learning journey does not end when you walk in and you know The learning journey is just beginning. And um, for me, <clears throat> reading is a really, really important part of that learning journey. And so I have read, I'm not no dates for a year, but I have read more than 20 books a year, every year. That becomes a mountain of material <laughs> um, over the course of a lifetime. So this commitment to learning and development is super important. So I told the story about how I had a career as a chief financial officer. Um, it was a great career and a great job. It was the, you know, the pinnacle of when I was an, uh, an accounting student. Um, I didn't put my title up. That would have been like the top aspiration um, that I had. So when when uh, Antrust got bought by Data Card, it's a much better company, the CEO I was like, I am not working for this other CEO. I am so out of here. And so then we all wrote to each other and said, well, someone's got to be in charge. And you know, one of my proudest moments was my peers said, Dave, we got you. And it wasn't because I was the smartest. Um, I was a really, really talented people on the leadership team. But I had taken the time to learn all about the company. I understood how marketing programs work, I understood how marketing leads, how sales opportunities, to turn to a sales funnel and sales process. I learned what development life cycle looked like. I couldn't write code, but I had learned. Uh, about these things, I learned how technology works. So when the time came, that learning had accumulated, that business learning had accumulated to a CFO. And they said, you know what? We think Dave's the guy who can brought him out and do this. So my career, whatever you want to call it, pinnacle, it came from learning. It came from a commitment to learning uh, over a long period of time. Applying lessons um, uh, quickly. Um, I, so I had this opportunity to become CEO, I talked about that, kind of accidental. So I got the president thing was great. Um, that was a really big change for me. I, I became a leader of leaders. And so another you know, mentor thing that I would share with you, and this is for your journey down, uh, down the road. The biggest changes for me in my career weren't around technology. They weren't around um, uh, necessarily uh, Problem solving or doing higher levels of accounting. For me, the biggest changes, the biggest learnings I had to do was to learn to be a manager and then to learn to manage managers and then to lead leaders. And those are really, really different things. And you, um, it, I, I don't know how they can teach it at UW App. It's, it's one of those things that uh, it's a lot of reading prepared me for understanding how, what it looks like to really be a manager, to really solve those first level problems, and what it looks like to manage managers and, and organize that work that way, 
between all four of the elite leaders. Those are the biggest changes. So I got to become the CEO. And, you know, I guess I had a nice, I was going to say no experience. I had that nice president role. But I had never been CEO before. What did I do? We went back as a leadership team. First week, I handed out the book, Scaling Up by Bernard Shore. So I read nine books between the time I got the job and the time I started. I put this book with these two books on everybody's desk. Actually, I had a secretary by them before I got there, but most on everybody's desk. Tom Collins, fifth way, scaling up like Mark Marsh. If you ever have the opportunity to start your own business or mentor somebody's small business, um, scaling up is a really neat little book. And we took that um, that framework in the middle of the book, and we said we are going to stop and we are going to identify who we are and what we believe. And this chart took the management team four months to build, but it became the foundation on which we built six. Who are we? We protect business communications for our customers and their communities. Why are we here? What do we do? What do we believe? <clears throat> you don't get the chance to buy a company like App River and for $275 million, you're just going to walk into Wall Street and say, hey, Wells Fargo, I'd like $100 million. Um, it was actually $175 we, uh, we had got from the, the lender we group. $100 million in equity from a private equity firm unless you have built it on identity and conviction. And we followed this core identity, this core conviction for a business strategy that led us to the opportunity to uh, buy App River, which is what has doubled the size of the company and has its position, I think, in a much, much stronger uh, position on the marketplace. And then what did we do after we brought together these two great companies, these two equal-sized companies? We went right back to the same principles. Who are we? What do we believe? What are our core values? I like the joke. This is the second time now. This is a, this is a million dollar chart. The first time I did it for the first time I did it for thirteen ninety five times twelve. Um, we bought the book and did it ourselves. The second time, I guess I might have spent a million dollars <laughs> <laughs> on consultants to help us walk through and research um, uh, our buyers and our market. So we really understood what they were looking for from us and really understand who we are as people and the core values. Always learning, teamwork, respect, integrity, always do the right thing, partner, customer first, the trip, the journey that we're on together as teams with a this company to a half a billion dollars or more in the next three to five years. Identity and conviction. There's more work I can talk to you about all night about some of the great things we've done. But I'm going to close um, with time for q and I'm going to close with a personal challenge. You know, I'm going to argue that I'm really not any smarter than anybody in this room. You know, everybody, by the fact that you're here, you're identifying to me your commitment um, to learning. So you're, this is a committed portion of the, the UWF student body. There's nobody in here who can't do amazing and incredible things. Um, but I, I'd like to take a personal challenge. I'd like you to take some time and really think deeply about who you are. Not the fact that you're a runner and a football fan, but who are you really? What is it that you really believe? What's most important to you? What is going to make you happy? What is going to be meaningful for you? What can you really lean into? For me, I knew I needed to be part of organizations. I knew I needed to lean in and make a difference. I needed, knew I needed to be someplace where I could feel that I was make, making a difference and a contribution. Those were important things to me. I knew that I was making a commitment in my career to continuous improvement. To my last thing is to learn. How are you contributing, continuing to learn and to contribute? What's your commitment to yourself to grow and to learn and to read? What's your commitment to yourself for a level of self-awareness? Ask mentors really honestly, how am I doing? 